What I'm going to be talking about is basically this 14 billion years history of our universe in basically 20 minutes. So it's going to be quick, right? And um, when I say that I'm going to talk about the story of the universe, I'm not mentioning a moment in time or a place in space, right? This is, this is kind of a really complicated beginning. But we have this idea that the universe kind of suddenly just bursted into existence, right? Out of nothing. It just appeared. And basically, the idea is that this very early universe, it was all filled up with energy. It was all energy. And this unified force that governed how everything evolved. And it was a really tiny universe. And it had an extreme amount of energy, which translates in a really high temperature. But it was expanding, right? And it was growing in size, and so on. <coughs> and as it was doing so, it was losing energy. And the unified forces started to separate into the four forces that we know govern nature today. And what happened very early, on, very early on in the growth of this universe is that, it, is that it grew from the size of an atom to approximately the size of an orange in 43 orders of magnitude below the time of a second in a really short amount of time. And what happened after this, this is what the moment that we call inflation, what happened after this is that we started to separate space and time as we know them today into more similar dimensions to what we actually understand. Together with this, the other thing that was happening is that all this energy that it was that we had in our universe was finally able to reach down other states that started to be actually stable, right? And this happened again as the universe expanded and cooled down. And so these stable states are what we call particles, right? And you guys have heard of many of them. Like you definitely heard the name electron, and there is this atomic nuclei. And so particularly, one of the things that happened in this very early universe is that quarks, for example, became stable. And these quarks, when you combine some of them, you can get the nuclei of the usual matter that we have around us, right? And so therefore, once again, we had all these quarks floating around in our early universe, and that generated the usual matter as we know it. But there is more to this really early universe. And you definitely heard also this fancy name to, that we give to other things. So altogether with all this matter that we generated at the early universe as a product of all the energy that we had in it, there is this other fancy component, which is called antimatter. And roughly speaking, we can conceive antimatter for the sake of what I'm going to talk about as kind of the opposite of, of matter. And when they actually see, when they get in contact with each other, when they touch each other, they annihilate and they release energy. And something really funny happened here. Because so far, what we believe happened is that for every 1,000 million particles of matter and for every 1,000 million particles of antimatter, there was a small, teeny, tiny excess of one particle of matter. And after the entire process of annihilation finished, everything that we see around us in the form of matter is actually the result of this small amount of garbage that was left as a result of this imbalance at the early universe. So what continued happening is that the universe continued growing in size and continued cooling down, and we reached these really low temperatures of actually 10 billion degrees, which is quite cold when you think about it. And you generate all these particles in the universe. We're left with protons, electrons, and light rays just trying to travel around. If you've been around for this afternoon, they've been telling you how photons were kind of trapped in this early universe, and they couldn't travel long distances. So this cold universe. It's going to be able to, after one second, start forming the, ato the first atomic nuclei. And after 300 seconds, the process is finished. And we get the actual final composition of the general universe. And there is a big prediction from the Big Bang. And we measure the composition. And actually, they match, which is a really strong proof of the actual process of the Big Bang that I've been talking about. So there is, we're actually not talking just about, about this just because we like the idea. There are some general ideas that are backing it. So we'll need 300,000 years to reach the next stage in this ladder of complexity that is kind of evolving with time, right? And so what's going to happen next is that the universe is going to be continue again losing temperature. This is kind of going to be the main topic around of the entire talk. It's going to continue expanding. It's going to continue losing temperature. And then the electrons that we find in this primordial soup of atoms are going to start to be trapped by the atoms, right? And they're going to combine with the protons and form particles. And therefore, the light rays that I'm going to start calling photons from now on are going to be able to freely travel without colliding with anything. 
And so what's going to happen once again is that this is going to release all the, all the light rays, all the, all the photons into the universe, and they're going to continue traveling up until today. And so the other atoms are going to combine, and they're going to stay combined with protons and electrons being together. So this remnant light is basically the last light at this very early universe. The universe goes dark. And as if you actually look back in time, you can actually see this remnant, right? This is what we call the cosmic microwave background. And in 1978, this actually got Penzias and Wilson a Nobel Prize for his discovery. And that object right there is one of the most studied things in, in human, by humanity. And it's super valuable from the, from the perspective of cosmology. But if we go back to our universe, right, the, the rest of the matter and so on, it actually continued evolving, right? And this was under the, the action of gravity. But it wasn't the normal matter that was dominating the process. It was a fancy component we call dark matter. I'll tell you more about it later on. But basically, there is way more dark matter than matter. So that implies that the process of collapse and the formation of structure was dominated by this dark matter. And the universe on really large scales, it kind of looks like this, like a large cosmic wave with filaments and nodes and so on. And it is in these very dense regions where filaments actually connect, where we're going to reach again the next step of complexity in our ladder. And so what's going to happen here is that we're going to have our normal matter falling into these nodes. And it's going to form these giant, massive clouds of gas right, that are extremely cold. And when I say extremely cold, we're talking about like, not like winter, like you go outside now. It's just kind of cold, right? We're talking about minus 200 degrees. So it's, it's fairly cold for the universe if you compare it with the previous temperatures that we had in it. And so what this is going to allow is that you can have as the universe gets colder, you can condense and, and confine more stuff in the same region. You can pile up more material, right? And therefore, as you do so, this material continues radiating energy and continues losing energy. And the first atom are going to be, are going to have like an energy low enough to start trapping each other and forming molecules. And molecules are kind of nice for us astrophysicists because what they allow us is that these things can vibrate and they can rotate and things like that. And they can even lose more energy which implies that you can pack more stuff together and you can have higher densities. And then you have this really dense, like this really high density core in the middle of the cloud that is attracting all the stuff that is outside. And you keep piling more stuff up and then the density increases, the temperature increases and increases and you know, like the rest of the cloud cannot see this, this process happening. So it continues falling and the temperature continues going up and you have closer and closer atoms. And at some point, the atoms start to collide with each other and fuse with each other and they release a lot of energy. But from the outside, you cannot see it, right? It's just a massive cloud. So what's going to happen eventually is that in this very center, fusion is taking place for the first time in the universe. And at some point, the process just starts to run away. There is a lot of energy being released. And from the very center of the cloud, you pretty much just deflagrate. The, the cloud just bursts into flames. And you generate, for the first time in the history of the universe, the first stars. And these first stars actually shine in the same way as the sun does, right? Once again, we have fusion fueling their cores, and that supports the rest of the, tar the star, and that throws a huge amount of light into the universe. And so this process of generating the first stars was happening all over the place in the entire universe once again. And one of the fancy things about it is that, if you remember, I mentioned that the universe went dark. There was no more light. So these stars are actually making the universe shine again. And one of the cool things we can do from the astrophysics perspective is we can study what is the pattern of the re-emission of light into the universe and see if that actually matches with what we actually observe out there. And this just kind of confirms our picture. And of course, we also want to go into the nitpicky details and we try to figure out more stuff. So we can do what I'm showing you in the top right is we can do computer simulations of how the universe starts to generate light again. And it kind of really matches what we actually predict, right? So it, once again, there is proof for all of these things I'm saying. Um, for, but then when you think about this, right, these first stars are forming in gas clouds, in these gas clouds that are all over the place and are throwing light into the universe once again. But these gas clouds are not just going to be there by themselves. There's going to be other gas clouds close to them. So when these gas clouds see each other, they attract each other by gravity. They grow in size, and they form these proto-galaxies, which is a really self-explanatory name when you think about it, because as you, as you merge further, more and more gas clouds, what you're going to start to get is galaxies, as our, as our own, actually, and so on. And so there is, I'd say, three main types of galaxies, right? Elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, and irregular galaxies. And I'm showing you here a computer simulation of the formation of a spiral galaxy, like the Milky Way. And there is a particular reason I think these kind of galaxies are fairly interesting. And the fact is, you can see now that you're getting more and more proto-galaxies and other galaxies to fall into your galaxy, and you get this nice disk right, of rotation. And so one cool thing you can do with physics is you can 
you can use the amount of stuff you see in the galaxy to compute how fast it should be rotated. So this is actually the very first proof that we have of the existence of dark matter. It might not be super convincing to you, I'll give you more later, but I think it's really important to point it out because it's the first one. We went out, we got astronomers, and they went out and they measured the rotation of galaxies in the outer bits, and they were rotating too quickly for the amount of things that you saw in the galaxies. So therefore people say, well, I think the easiest explanation is that there is actually things that are not shining, but still in the galaxy. So there is some matter, some dark matter that we can't see, and therefore that actually explains the rotation of our galaxy. So this is the first proof of the actual existence of dark matter. And so, okay, we have one galaxy here, but obviously the universe is quite vast, there's a lot of things in it, and there has to be other galaxies forming around it, right? So this is actually the case, and in many regions, in the especially in the highest densities in the universe, there are several galaxies forming and merging with each other, growing in size, and we form what we call galaxy groups, then there's these galaxy clusters where there's tons and tons of galaxies and there's actually in, submerged in this super hot gas, and in the very center there is a lot of galaxies coalescing with each other, merging with each other, growing in size, and forming these tremendous beast galaxies, these tremendous elliptical beast galaxies that are the most massive galaxies in the universe. And um, if you notice what happened through and throughout this process is that we started forming really small things and we got them together, we merged them together, and we formed bigger and bigger things. So this is what we call the process of formation bottom up of, the, of this stuff in the universe. And I'm gonna show you here, this is a super fascinating video. I love this video, it's by the Sloan Collaboration. They had these telescopes, they open every night, and they took pictures in galaxies, of, well, of galaxies. And what they did for this video is they put the galaxies in the real position around us, right? And you can see that the universe actually has this kind of filamentary structure when you look at the galaxies. There's kind of just filaments of stuff floating around. So another really strong proof of the existence of dark matter is the fact that if you want to reproduce the structure that we see in the universe around us, with computer simulations of the formation of structure, the only way you can get our simulations to look like reality is actually including dark matter, right? But this is not the reason I love this video. It's a completely different one. And it's just, if you actually go back to the, this huge image, right, and you realize how large is the amount of space that is between galaxies compared with the galaxies, which tend to be bigger than our galaxy, which is way bigger than the spiral arm where the solar system is. And this spiral arm is way bigger than the solar system, which is way bigger than the sun, which is way bigger than the earth, which is way bigger than this country, which is way bigger than this sun, which is way bigger than this building, which is way larger than every single one of us. You start to conceive, or just actually realize how much we cannot conceive, how immense the universe is. And I forgot to say this, actually only the local universe. But, okay, leaving that aside, we also discovered quite recently the largest structure of which clusters of galaxies and galaxies are part of. And for the case of our galaxy, this is Laniakea, right? So the Milky Way is supposed to be part of this super cluster structure around us. So this is kind of part of your address if you're getting mail from a different part of the universe. Okay, so that's, a, that's what's actually happening for the larger structures, right? But what's happening on the other end? So if you remember, we're forming all these stars in the smallest scales and they were in the very first stars of the universe, and yay, it was cool, and things, but these stars probably really disappear a lot, like long time before all this process of formation of structures that I mentioned, right? And so, once again, going back to these stars, as I said, these, they are supported and fueled by fusion processes occurring in the very center, but at some point, you can imagine them just running out of fuel. They're just gonna run out of stuff, stuff to fuse together, right? And so when this happens, the general picture is that the rest of the star just has nothing to support it anymore and starts to fall towards the very center. The center is really dense, and then these outer layers of the stars bounce off and they explode in a supernova, right? You might have heard this somewhere in the building before. There's actually really good experts, world-renowned experts on stars, and what is actually left after you have the explosion of a star in the, in the cafe area today, so you should guys go talk with them, because I'm not gonna mention any of the cool things that you get when a star dies, like a neutron star, a white dwarf, or black holes, right? And you all have heard about all these fancy things that happen around a black hole with space and time, and they have this super cool thing that is amazing from an astrophysical perspective, is the fact that when you have these black holes, they can throw these incredibly powerful jets of plasma, a super energetic plasma into galactic distances, so for the case of black holes in the center of galaxies, you can just cross huge distances across the universe, but again, I'm not gonna touch on that. So, what I want to point out of what is happening with these very first stars is that they're generating 
and you heard this before again, all the materials, they're fusing all the materials that we have around us, right? Iron, carbon, hydrogen, all these things. And obviously they throw this back into the galaxy and gravity is still operating in galaxies and what's gonna lead is to the next step in complexity, right, once again. And so what's gonna happen is these materials are gonna start to be pulled together into new clouds and these new gas clouds are gonna start to collapse and condense and they're gonna flatten and they're gonna, and they're gonna form this protoplanetary disk. Again, a really self-explanatory name, right? And I actually have a really good, cool picture of this protoplanetary disk taken by the telescope ALMA, which is this one here, right? This is an actual picture of a protoplanetary disk. But what, you, what are these things? Well, once again, it's just a cloud of stuff forming a star in the very center. So you can see the formation of the star in the middle. But now the difference with the other clouds is that we have a lot of dust and kind of dusty material around it. They have all these tiny pebbles and they're actually gonna start to coalesce and merge with each other and grow in size and form bigger rocks and these rocks are gonna make, make like even larger rocks and so on and like by the action of gravity and, and just all these things piling up together, at some point you're gonna get to these kind of balls that you can see orbiting around this star, right? These protoplanets. And these protoplanets are gonna grow in size and you guys can tell where this process is going, right? As these things, things continue growing, eventually you're gonna get a fairly quiet system rotating around the star and then you're gonna be left with all sorts of planets of all shapes, well, not shapes, shapes tend to be wrong, but like all kind of colors, all kind of compositions, size, gas, all these things, right? And actually something pretty cool is that we've discovered almost, we've discovered almost 4,000 planets out there already, and this is mostly a merit by the Kepler telescope, but there is a new, gen there's more generations coming, so we'll discover many more. And we know at least out there there is one system which has a planet located at the proper distance from its star. Actually, it means that it's not too close, not too far, so you can actually have um, liquid water. It actually has a stable orbit, it has an atmosphere, so on, it has an energy source, meteoric, me meteoric membranes, who knows, right? Like, and you guys know where this is leading, but I'm not gonna talk about life, actually. I'm gonna finish the talk talking about quite the opposite, which is what is the fate of our universe? Effectively, what is the death of our universe? And so, if we want to figure this, we have to go back to the very thing I've been mentioning all the time through and over and over, right? And it's that the universe is expanding, and it continues expanding today. But it doesn't just expand in a random way. It actually has what we measure to be an accelerated expansion. So if we want to know what is the, what is the fate of the universe gonna be, we need to understand this process of expansion, right, for it. And so the way to do this is to understand what is the shape of the universe, what is the composition of the universe. We need to measure that. And um, six, seven, 2011, this actually was worth a Nobel Prize uh, to Rees, Palmutter, and Smith by actually studying and discovering the accelerated expansion of the universe. So how did they do this? Um, the whole idea for, for these discovery, these three guys there. And so the whole idea to discover this is that we know how stars, how much stars are supposed to shine when they explode, right? So you go out there, you measure stars exploding at different distances, and you kind of measure how much the universe has expanded in between explosions. And so this is gonna tell you effectively what is the composition of the universe. And that was actually quite surprising when we actually got the numbers, right? Because if you think about the matter that surrounds us, this usual matter, this is only, this matter is only 5% of the amount of stuff that there is out there. There is this 25% here, there is this dark matter, which we know has gravity and has to be there, that's it. And there is 70% of, um, I'm not allowed to use those words, stuff that we don't know why it is. We call it dark energy because it has to be there and it has this, it's actually responsible of the expansion of the universe. In some way, we don't really understand, right? And so knowing this composition, we can go and tell what is the shape of the universe in a mathematical way, right? In a topological way, it's complicated stuff, right? but it can either be closed, flat, or open. And so for, these, the, for the case of an open universe, what this is telling us is that the universe is gonna continue expanding faster and faster up to the point that every single piece of stuff out there is gonna be isolated. The flat universe is slightly more optimistic because this expansion is gonna progressively slow down, but still everything's gonna end up isolated. And then once you cross the, the line and you go to the other stream, the closed universe is a universe that is eventually be gonna, be gonna be governed by gravity and everything's gonna collapse together back to one point and that's it, that's the end of the universe. So we can go measure it, right? And we did, we actually have gone out there and we've found the answer 
to this question, what is the fate of the universe? And one of the, one of the graphs containing the answer is this one. So what is it? That's, that's the main question, right? Like, what's going to happen with our universe? Well, we measure it, and it's really, really, really extremely close to flat. But it's compatible with being open and being closed. So what, what does this mean, right? Like, that's, that's the kind of question. And so there is an answer for this. Um, and with, it's, it's actually really similar with, to what happens with most of the questions, the big questions that man, mankind actually f has to face. So the answer to this is that I see a lot of young faces in the audience. We need you guys to come and help us solve it because we just have no idea. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your time. <laughs>